Hello, everyone. I'm Vera oh. Perkins, president of the African American Alumni Association of Case Western Reserve University. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you this evening. Thank you for taking the time out to join us. I hope that you and your loved ones are healthy and safe. And we pray for safety for all of our family and friends and the whole entire community of Case Western Reserve University. The African American alumni purpose is to provide support and network opportunities to African American alum and to promote the success of the alum and the current students at Case. Our support is extended to all of the areas that involve our students as well as our faculty and our alum. So we hope that the association continues to provide a forum for everyone to be a part of and to be included in all of the directions that the university is heading. And so before I begin um, the program today, I'd like to give you a, a few housekeeping rules. Everyone is muted by default and we ask you to please remain muted um, to limit the background noise during the program. We know that some of you have already submitted questions and we hope to get to them throughout the course of the evening. If you have additional questions or thoughts, we ask you to please, again, uh, use the chat feature. Um, this renaming yourselves, I think most of us have done that. If you're not already, we welcome you to rename yourself by clicking on the participants, finding your name, and then using the more option selected rename. Now it gives me pleasure to introduce our host for the evening, Dr. Heather Burton. Dr. Burton is a graduate of the Ohio State University with a Bachelor of Arts in Journalism and African American Studies with a minor in theater, a master of social work from the University of Akron, a master's of public administration and doctor of philosophy in urban studies and public affairs, both from Cleveland State University. Dr. Burton is Senior Director for Faculty and Institutional Diversity with Case Western Reserve University, specializing in gender and racial equity. Dr. Burton works to encourage individual and systemic change through policy and practice. She also serves as acting co-director for the African and African American Studies Program, and she is an adjunct faculty in theater and social work teaching on concepts of race, racism, and social policy. Because of her diligence and dedication to reflect change within the community and Case Western Reserve University, she has received the Feminist Mentor Award, Staff Diversity Award, and so on and so on. She is a, a jewel to have here at Case. And at this time, I'd like to turn the program over to Dr. Burton. Thank you, Vera. Thank you so much. Um, as you were reading the bio, I'm thinking to myself, this isn't about me. This is about the provost today. I don't need my information actually read, but I thank you. Um, and I thank you for this opportunity. I'd like to thank the African American Alumni Association, along with um, the office that I work in, the Office of Inclusion, the Office for Inclusion, Diversity, and Equal Opportunity, as well as our African and African American Studies minor for uh, sponsoring this, this event on this evening. And this will be an ongoing series that uh, the three of our offices have developed um, to highlight our faculty and to provide profiles of excellence that's happening across Case's campus. And so tonight we are honored because our first guest in this Profiles of Inclusive Excellence is our provost, uh, none other than Provost Ben Vinson. So we are very excited to have an intimate conversation with Provost Vinson and discuss some of the things that um, are happening with him, but to give you just a different perspective also of Provost Vinson. And so typically, you know, we all have the opportunity to hear him in um, academic settings or in formal meetings as he discusses the strategic plan and the strategies for Case Western Reserve. But tonight we're gonna go a little personal and we're gonna uh, get to know Provost Benson as part of uh, the Case Western Reserve community. So kind of to begin, Provost Benson, I don't know if you remember the 2002 movie, Brown Sugar that starred Sanai Lathan and um, Tay Diggs. In that movie, there was a common theme that ran throughout that movie um, around hip hop. 
And the question that I always preface was, when did you fall in love with hip hop? And so today, what I ask you is, when did you fall in love with history? And so who or what caused you to choose this particular field? When did you fall in love with history, Provost Vincent? Wow, uh, Professor Burton, uh, first of all, let me first of all say, say thank you uh, for, for having me kick off this program. I mean, we have some incredible people as our, who are part of our community that, and that, that you would think uh, to come to me, I, I really feel special. And I wanna thank all of you as well for, for coming out uh, at, at the dinner hour uh, to do this. Uh, it really, really means a lot. I know uh, some of you may be breaking bread behind those names, so I, I, you know, I, 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 I'll, I'll grant you that. But, uh, but first of all, just thank you for, for spending this time with me. Um, Heather, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, when I, I guess when I think back to it, to be honest with you, I've always loved history. Um, I, I'm not going to lie. It's been something that's been a part of me. I'll never forget when I was growing up, my, uh, my mom, who was an educator, she, uh, she taught elementary school. And then uh, later in life, uh, transition, when we came to the United States, uh, we, she uh, actually uh, taught at-risk at youth um, and so she really, at an early age, always made me aware, you know, what's the significance of every single day? So uh, I'll never forget, you know, coming to her and she would tell me, you know, this day is about this and this happened on this day. And I kind of carry that with me. And um, I really got fascinated, too, by, uh, by the personages of history. Now, um, I used to read uh, as a kid uh, voraciously, and um, a lot of these were, I, I, I confess, I like mystery stories and comic books as a kid. I, you know, I like that. Um, but I also like biographies and Alexander the Great, Joan of Arc. I mean, all, the, the, all these, you know, these historic figures. Uh, and what you may not know, or some of you may know, is I actually was raised partly in Europe. Um, I, I was born in South Dakota, in Rapid City. And then at a very young age, I can't even remember Rapid City, uh, was, uh, my dad was a military man. And, and we went uh, to Vicenza, in Northern Italy. And so the co combination of my mom, and also living in Italy and seeing these ruins on a, on a constant basis. We lived in a small town called Sovizzo, just outside of Vicenza. Uh, and so I was exposed to Italian culture and everything else. And we, weekends we would go visit, you know, uh, go to Padova and we would go, go to Florence. You know, all that stuff was in me. And, you know, it just kept going, Heather. And um, I will say, you know, as with everyone else in college, I was trying to struggle, you know, what am I going to do? What am I, how, what's life going to look like? Um, but it would always, history was my comfort place. And, uh, uh, and even as I was wrestling, after, after uh, finishing up undergrad, thinking about going to law school, was on the fast track to law school, history always called. Uh, and so I, I took, a, you know, took a chance. And I think it's working out, Heather. I think it's I think it's I think it's going okay. I think it's done well for you. I think it's it's I think it's taking you to some great places. <laughs> <laughs> so so in that um you know you mentioned growing up in Europe. Tell us a little bit about that experience. What was it like for you growing up in Europe? So it was absolutely phenomenal for me. Uh, you know, I grew up, uh, I was young enough. I was bilingual. You know, my parents used me as the translator, uh, all that kind of stuff. I went to Italian schools young, uh, and then moved over to the base school when I got a little bit older. But, you know, it was, it was fascinating. Um, and just also, I will, I will be very honest with you. You know, we would spend obviously the year in, you know, most of the year, the school year in, in Italy. But in the summers, we would come back to the United States. Every summer, things were the juxtaposition of coming here and then and being living there and then having to live by different codes. You know, it was the 70s and, you know, uh, people, my, my parents said, don't don't play with those kids. You know, don't don't do that. I'm like, what do you mean don't do that? I mean, I've been doing this all my all my life. But it, it was just a juxtaposition. So it was the slow introduction, you know, to to this different, you know, the norms of, 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 of race mm -hmm. uh, as lived in the United States. There was mess going on in Italy too. I mean, to be honest with you, I'll never forget as a kid, you know, always, people always wanted to rub my head for good luck. Uh, and as a kid, because if you rub the head of a black child, that's supposed to bring good luck. Um, you know, I, at a certain point, I, I just got wise and I, uh, and I started 
uh, I, I used to say, dami soldi, dami soldi, uh, 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 give me money, give me money for it. Uh, so I, I basically, you know, I, I got the equivalent of a of hundred lira, uh, which is about a quarter. Uh, you know, so I, I started making it a business. You know, you, you tuck my head, I get some money and I made it into a transaction. Very young, uh, uh, you know, but, you know, it wasn't without its, its issues, but it was just different living uh, kind of this racial skin in, in two, two geographies. Uh, and, you know, my parents from the South, from Alabama. And, and so things that scene, you know, in, in the 70s, uh, you, you, you know what it's, you, you know, the drill. Right. So all of that, you know, it's just is it, interesting, very, very interesting. Yeah. Um, so so do, do I have permission now that when microaggressions come against me about my hair and someone asks to touch it, I can ask them to pay me? <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that to you, Heather. <laughs> I'll leave that one up to you. But speaking of race, um, as one of few Black provosts, what challenges do you face uh, from the academy as it relates to issues of social justice and race? Look, it's a great, it's a great question. I mean, things have heated up mightily. Um, there are certain things uh, that that I think are, are obvious. You know, one is, um, you know, living in the skin that that I'm in. Uh, there are certain expectations about you know. You, know, you you're going to do this and X and X Y and Z, um, and yes, I, I I want to 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 make fundamental change as provost. I want to do that. Uh, I, I try to do that, uh, but in the moment where we're de- where look when we sat down with our students in in June, for instance, there's no patience. Uh, it, it has to be done now, so I carry that that weight of urgency. And the reality of, of knowing that things have to work in a certain and operate in, in a certain way. So the urgency is a pressure for accomplishing the, so, the social justice outcomes that, that we need that we need as a society to come to, to, to come to this greater reckoning, uh, to become the, the place that we articulate that we have always been um, in, in, the, in the deep creed of our history. And, and, and when you look back at, 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 the, at the framers, uh, uh, the, the incomplete promise of, of, of America. Uh, mm-hmm. So that, that's really one of the pressures is, is living with the expectations and urgency of what needs to be done and, in the re- and living in the reality of the role uh, and, and the reality of the institutional framework uh, of the now. So that, that's part of it. Yeah, and, and, and in that, I was just thinking and. Um, and I, I do want to stay on kind of the, the subject and saying around race and, and how it relates within the context of the institution. But you speak of urgency uh, and the pressures that you deal with. And in that, how do you pull back and navigate as, as provost? Because you are a person too. And so you have to work through your own challenges in the institution as well as outside of the institution. So what are some of the things that you have found work for you in terms of dealing with those pressures? You know, look, it's a combination of things. One is just the inner, the, the inner, the things that you do internally uh, to, to, to stay, to stay steadfast. And so, um, you know, it's a combination of, of faith, family, uh, uh, all of the things that that settles one, um, but also it's you know having been in the academy for a while, it's it's understanding kind of the the rhythms and patience uh, to to get the objectives done, um, staying staying on task, uh, but just having you know for me having been here a while, the maturity of of, of navigating uh, uh, through through the through an institution um, and knowing that that the good work is 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 getting done. Uh, um, it, it just may not be at, at, at a particular rhythm, uh, um, but sometimes it is. Um, I, I will say that the, the moment of these times has, uh, has really heightened the overall awareness and made far more things possible than, uh, than has been done, has been possible in, in, in recent years, quite frankly. Uh, I'm very optimistic about where where we're headed as an institution, uh, and, and the types of change that 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 can happen, um, given uh, the intensity uh, and and the I would say also the the honesty that people are bringing to to the conversation and the determination. I mean, when you see protests not not collapsing and 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 not flinching and and the steady drumbeat. 
that gives you a different type of optimism. Uh, and it just signals to me uh, uh, that there's something deeper now than, than there has been. I would agree. I would agree. And I think, you know, capitalizing on, uh, on, on the way at where, so where society is right now uh, gives us leverage, gives us benefit, allows us to move forward, especially as we continue to work and do work at the institution. And, and one thought that I have is that you are one of few Black provosts. That's statistical data that we know this. And so in that, what are you doing to ensure that more members of the academy look like you and me, specifically at Case Western Reserve and elsewhere? So uh, I'm doing all of the things that, that I can do in, in, in the role. Uh, one, you may have seen uh, last year, I had an ACE fellow uh, who was uh, shadowing me uh, all year from the University of Maryland at Baltimore County, uh, who is, uh, he was just promoted. Uh, he was an associate dean and uh, was just promoted to associate provost after this year, uh, after the year that, uh, that, that concluded. Um, and so as best as possible, doing mentoring um, uh, mentoring uh, and, and inviting people in. Uh, uh, there's the, the efforts that I've been trying to do in terms of uh, w with, I see my partner, uh, Rob Solomon on the screen uh, and also with many of our faculty and, and, and many of our deans, uh, the hard work of trying to build pipelines uh, that will uh, ensure uh, more that our campus will be uh, both more diverse and more inclusive. Uh, those are things that, that we are, we're trying to accomplish uh, at a student level, at a faculty level, and at a staff level. And, and so those are, those are things that, that we're actively, actively trying to do. We're applying for a grant um, uh, from the NIH uh, that will help us try to, to diversify ourselves in, in STEM. Uh, I've been working on another grant in the humanities space, uh, trying to cultivate leadership uh, for humanists. Uh, that also uh, have a, has a diversity goal as well built into it. Um, in a previous life, uh, at my previous institution, uh, in close work with the donor, um, I was able to uh, help create a Hispanic leadership institute uh, for undergraduates uh, and graduate students. And so uh, it's just at, at, at every opportunity that, that a role like this offers to, to, to really help shape uh, the pipeline and shape the environment and ecosystem for inclusion. Uh, I try my best to to take those uh, take those examples, uh, take those excuse me those those opportunities. I um I, I see a question from the chat, and so I I'm going to kind of break from my questions just for a moment, just to, to ask this question of you, uh, Provost Vincent. And the question comes in, um, how do you envision CWRU's linking to the surrounding community as a supportive neighbor? Along with your great books, what are some, re some of the reads you recommend? And let's first, let's, let's talk about the surrounding community as a supportive neighbor, beca neighbor because I know, um, and, and I could actually, I'm laughing as you give the initiatives of what you plan. And I'm thinking, well, you've got more than that on the plate, but it's not my interview to tell everything that you're doing and that you've been encouraged across. Um, but, you know, there are quite a few initiatives that are behind you. But when we talk about the surrounding community, um, how do you envision CWR's linking? I think that we have an obligation to work with our community and to help uplift our surrounding community. Uh, I know for a fact that we are trying to make inroads into East Cleveland and uh, we have the Provo Scholars Program, which uh, is working with, with students in East Cleveland uh, to, to assist them with their own personal uplift. Uh, and uh, I think that as a university, we actually have done a lot but it's all flown a lot for some reason under the radar. Um, I was also just reading an article. Um, one of our uh, one of our alums and close friends and trustees recently passed me the uh, the Bloomberg article on on the Cleveland Clinic that has recently run uh, about how how that institution can thrive yet its neighborhood uh, is is uh, is is not thriving. Um, I think those are the types of things that we have to we have to do. We have a we have a mission to educate and to uplift, and those are the people who come in our doors, and those are the people who are also outside of our doors. Um, and so I find it 
I find it hard to hear the stories of members of of Cleveland who have who drive down Euclid Avenue and drive right through our campus and and don't even don't even know we're here. Uh, don't even feel any sense any sense of connection or of belonging or, or invitation. Um, I was speaking at a high school, uh, or at a, I'm sorry, an eighth grade class just a couple of weeks ago, uh, or man, it was actually last week, it feels like a couple of weeks ago, uh, about, about some of these very, very points that, that Case Western Reserve is, 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 is part of Cleveland and that we, are, that we are here for them and that we want to see them here and that we may not know the, the road that, that any individual has traveled. We may, not be, we may not know their story. But at the end of the day, that doesn't completely matter because we know where they're trying to go. And that's where an institution like ours can help. Our community is trying to get somewhere. We can help. And so I see that as, 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 as an obligation, and I see that as part of our mission, and as part of our strategic plan uh, to be an institution, a high-impact research university that, that strives to create social impact. Excellent. You know, I wanna, I'm going to come back to your um, question about the books in a moment. I won't forget that that question was asked, but what I do want to ask you is, um, you know, one of the things when I first heard you speak in 2018, when you arrived at Case Western Reserve University, you stood up and I think it might have been your welcome reception. You stood up and, 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 and the word that stood out to me, probably out of everything that you said, is that you tied in slavery to a statement that you were making about the institution. And I said, man, the provost gets it. I was like, who is this new provost? He gets it. And so in that um, and in. And, 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 and being myself with, with history and understanding and looking at history from that perspective, tell us more about your individual research and, and okay. give us a little bit more about your book and everything else so that people can really know what was the background and um, to your own research. So I'm a, I'm a historian of race in Latin America, uh, especially Mexico. Um, all of this was born in, in two, two things. First of all, my international background made me very curious about the African diaspora and how, how, how do blacks live abroad uh, how, throughout the world? There's a, there's a much larger story than just the African-American story. And how does it all fit together uh, if it does at all? Uh, when I was coming through college, um, I also realized back then that with the growing Lat, lat, what we call the Latinx population now, that greater Black-Brown alliances were, go, were going to be needed in the future. Um, and I, I thought that I had a role to play in, in trying to help, help that process from a scholarly realm, uh, from a scholarly uh, perspective. And by that, I mean, um, in many Latin American societies, Blackness has been denied um, or it has been swept to the side uh, conveniently uh, for other national histories. And so I've tried to recover that through my scholarship and especially in a place like Mexico where, you know, for it's, people may now have more common knowledge of the black presence in Mexico, but when I was coming, coming through, that was, people were shaking their head, no way, what? what? Argentina, Mexico, these other places, blackness was invisible. Uh, but there's a rich, rich story there. And so I dedicate, I've dedicated my scholarly career to try and understand several things. One, the history of slavery in Latin America. And I confess, I do not actually, I hate the history of slavery, but it's necessary. <laughs> it's necessary to, to study. Uh, the history of freedom uh, for, for Blacks in Latin America, which is where I've, I've probably made my greatest uh, scholarly interventions. Uh, and then trying to tie all of that into the understanding of, of racial ideology and how those things get twisted and turned over time. How does racial ideology function when you have to, when you have to appreciate these other deeper histories? That's what, my, that's what all my books, uh, at, at the end of the day, that's what they're all about. And then in Mexico in particular, uh, I saw an opportunity to do some work on the border because too many people see the border as migration into the United States. But there was black migration into Mexico and into Latin America. People were trying to get out of here to get to there for a better life. How does that complicate our understandings of the border? 
uh, and, and, and reframe things. All of this, if blackness is understood better, then it becomes a place, a, 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 a space for, for discussion between populations that might not see themselves as aligned, that might see themselves in competition, that might see themselves in conflict. That's the project. That's what all my work has been in try, trying to do that, to build that bridge between these populations that are so fundamental to who we are now as a country. I agree. I agree. And, and, and if we would understand, as you said, we could get a lot further and have the conversations that are necessary. Um, there's a question that's coming in from the chat that I want to kind of throw in. A student asks you, or a student asks you, what does diversity mean to you? How would you respond? Because diversity it means everything. <laughs> I mean, that's a, it's, I mean uh, we, we can't live without diversity. We can't succeed. We can't breathe without diversity. And even those who've, who've done a, a job of trying to suffocate that in their own way by through the act of suffocation have acknowledged diversity. It is the very ether of our world. And even in places that are so-called homogeneous, people naturally find ways to diversify. That's, that, that it's, it's almost an element of the human experience. And so that's, that's exactly how I see it. It's, it's our ether. Um, uh, and uh, and it, what we have to do is, is make sure that we wrestle with this implication so that everyone can bring their true selves to the table. And that's where diversity, you know, the power of diversity, and there's a book on that, and I don't know if it's, this is not the thesis, but it's my own inter reinterpretation. Of the power of diversity is unlocking our individuality for, we, for us to contribute our whole selves to our society. Simple. Anything that, that, that inhibits that locks up the true potential of who we are as humans and who we can be as a society. Um, so I'm thinking, and I'm thinking as you're saying that, especially talking about true selves and, and diversity being our true, being able to be our true selves. I was having a conversation earlier today with Vice President Solomon uh, and, and talking about bringing your whole self to work and your whole self to the environment. What advice would you give to a student uh, around how to bring your whole self to a institution that his, has historically been a predominantly white institution and in spaces uh, where your classes and everything else, especially when we're talking about black students, how can they, what advice would you give them to bring their, their whole self to that environment? It's a hard question. Bringing your whole self brings, brings pain. It brings struggle. It brings debate. It brings everything. And so when you have the feelings of, hitting your head against the wall, inspect that, reach deep. There's something there that you, can, that you can do an introspection that gives you a clue to why you are bringing that to this particular situation. Identify it. And then once you've identified it, it's something that becomes part of your arsenal, part of your toolkit in other situations. Sometimes when you when you in a, in a moment of pain, the pain itself consumes all. But it's really it's a reaction, right? It's a brain body connection. When you're understanding the everything that's involved in that process, you're better. And and that and and that pain is it, it, it's it operates and looks differently in, in, in other types of situations. And these are, you know, Navy SEALs, et cetera. We all know how they undergo certain trainings so they can overcome their pain, et cetera, et cetera. Some of that's about understanding the, 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 the processes at play. Bringing your true selves is, is understanding, again, all of your reactions to, to these situations, at least in my, again, this is my simple point of view. It's, it's worth two cents, Heather. <laughs> take, take it for what, what, what you will. But I do think, that it involves, again, understanding your, how you are in, interacting with your environment and not 
yeah, and utilizing those as opportunities for, for you to, to grow and, and to learn, to interact again, better, et cetera, over time. That's, that's how I see it. Yeah, and I would say, I think your opinion is worth more than two cents, maybe five cents. <laughs> all right, give me, give me a nickel. All right, I'll take a nickel. <laughs> But no, but I appreciate the honesty and, and the truth about what it means to bring your true self or bring your whole self to, um, to, to a situation, to an environment, especially when you're navigating uh, systems that were not generally created for you to be in, in mainstream. Um, one, one, a question that I do have also is, how do you challenge the minds of students without being in the classroom? Well, it's you know, as a provost, what, what you have the opportunity to do is to be in dialogue on the shape of learning. Uh, and so curriculum, uh, research, the, the, the type of professors that students will interact with, um, the climate of a school. Uh, it's at those levels, the meta level, where a, a provost has, 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 the, has the most impact. Uh, and so, you know, a student may never see some of the work that, 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 I, that I, may have, I may be doing to help set the table for a type of learning that might be possible. Um, uh, but it's really, in, it's really in framing. I, I, someone asked me this, and I, I felt this, uh, and I, I'll share this with you too, and I may have shared this with you before, or some of you. One of the interesting things about being a provost or any administrator is as you, as you flow through these, these ranks is the opportunities to, to in, instill values into an institution uh, that otherwise doesn't have them. I mean, it's, it, the institutions are you know, at their core, they, they, are, they, they, they don't feel, but you do. Uh, and so these are the opportunities. You bring values, you bring perspectives, and you, you transmit those into the, into the schools, into the faculty and departments through uh, osmosis and through other uh, kind of, um, uh, let's say, indirect and direct measures that then actually seep into the classroom. And then sometimes I do, you know, I've given a couple of guest lectures and uh, sometimes I actually, uh, you know, I, I've mentored a, a couple of students from Case Western Reserve. Uh, so there, I do have some more direct connections as well, my student office hours, uh, which uh, I'm really, I'm getting perhaps more than the students out of those. But those, those, are other, uh, those are other vehicles as well. Yeah, and I always say the students keep us young. That's yes. why we have to keep them around because they keep us young. Um, so speaking of climate of the school, there's a question that came in the, the chat that I feel ties into that because I was gonna ask a little bit more about that, but I'll go to the chat. Can you talk about the leader behaviors you model to faculty and students to encourage a climate of inclusion so all viewpoints are valued? You said the leader behavior? The leader behaviors. So I'm, I'm thinking in other words, what are some of the behaviors that you demonstrate or that you model to the campus community to encourage um, a climate of inclusion? No, I try my best to listen, uh, to listen deeply and to take in what, what I hear. And, um, you know, part of, part of the role here as provost is, is ingesting and then also connecting. Uh, so if you're not listening, you can't do that work. And so for me, trying keenly to hear all perspectives, all audiences that are part of our community, and then processing and then trying to connect across, even if it's across silos, uh, that, that's, that's important work. Um, another part of the work of, of the leader role, I think, for, at least for me, is authenticity. Um, I can't be any other way and I'm not gonna pretend to be and if I do, then I'm probably cheating the institution because I'm not bringing who I am to Case Western Reserve University. And so, and then encouraging others to, to do the same, um, to, to, to bring themselves. Uh, that's, that, that's very important. Um, and then another, the last one really is, is to the best extent possible, trying to be empathetic, um, trying to truly as best as one is, is possible, to understand the other person's perspective, why they are coming to the table the way they are, understanding that trying to live in those shoes for a bit, to learn from that experience, to move and elevate the institution and all of us uh, to a better place. 
those are the basic things that, that I try to live by um, uh, in terms of also trying to trying to be prompt in terms of my responses uh, as much as I can. Uh, I will confess an avalanche of email hurt hits at times. I'm looking at somebody on this screen. She knows who she is, uh, where I, I've been way too long uh, getting back in touch. And I apologize profusely for that. And, and, and speaking of emails and, and um, the level of emails that I'm sure you get, um, I, I know how many emails I get per day. So I can only imagine what your email looks like per day. But in that, you know, it, it's rumored that when you go to administration from faculty, you go to the dark side. So now Provost Vincent, you're on the dark side as an administrator. <laughs> you have joined the ranks of the dark side. But in that, what is um, what do you think is are some differences between being a provost and being faculty? Look, uh, Heather, the biggest difference between provost and faculty is for faculty, you know, it's it's a lot about it's a lot about you, you know, it's about your research, your program, your teaching. Um, it, there, there's a way in which that uh, there's. There's a lot of, of of one's individuality wrapped up. You're an entrepreneur. You're 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 all of that. Uh, when, when you when you become provost, it's about we. It's about it's you you check all of that at the side. You have some. In my case, you, know, you have to sacrifice too. Other a lot of a lot of things. Um, some you know, some of your personal life, some of your your research, has to be checked at the door for the for the greater for the greater community. Um, that's that's really probably the biggest biggest thing uh, is that it's all about it's all about us uh, at, at this point, um, and it's all about not just us, but us in the world, us in again in Cleveland, us in and in, in our alumni body, us in it. That's that it, it's really more plural at this point, um, and uh, one has to one has to be comfortable enough to be honest with you to 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 let those let the me go um and uh that's uh you know i i've come to to some peace with that uh there are moments where hey, it's hard you know, let's be honest but um you you have to come to peace with that yeah yeah you do um and and and, and giving up a, you have to become selfless <laughs> and and in it in that you know we know that you are a family man so Besides your family, what are some other things that are important to you outside of the institution? Wow, I mean, I, I uh, you know, my family and I, I use the the big F there. I mean, it's my parents, it's my uh, all of that. Um, outside of that, un unfortunately, um, one of the things I've learned too is as I've moved <laughs> in in deeper into administration, deeper into the dark side. <sighs> right, you need you need uh, to have on black uh, and sunglasses uh, right now. <laughs> as I as I've moved deeper in, uh, uh, you know that that has uh, it's it's basically there's there's not much more room uh, uh, for uh, for much um, uh, beside that. So uh, you asked me to. <laughs> You 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 forced me to do that, Heather. I see, I see. I think it's adding entertainment to the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, do you have other any other questions for? Oh yeah, we do. I do. Um, I didn't know if you were finished with the the, the outside of the institution. I, I don't. I don't have finished. a lot more. <laughs> Look, taking my kids to get a haircut, taking them to practice. I mean, there's there's not enough other room uh, for, for for much else. All right. That was. I was like waiting for some more, but I see that we only we didn't have much. So within the institution, what are some things that are important to you? Oh wow. Um, it's hard to hard to this really. This list be, better not be longer yeah, than the yeah. family promos. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I guess you know. Keep it simple. It, it's it's about the people. Um, you know, I I learned that quickly here. Um, we are the type of place uh, we, where I learned as well that that, that we matter. People matter. Not, I, I don't take that lightly. Not all institutions you can really say that. And, and so for me, it's 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 the value of us. Um, uh, to be very honest with you, and uh, um, our institution, in some ways. Is 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 not is just it's a reflection of us, but at the same time, it it in some ways it it, it nurtures and nourish nourishes us, uh, and so that's that's really what what it is for me. 
Um, there's a question coming in from the chat that I want to ask, and there are a few that I'm going to come back to. Listening audience, don't think that I've forgotten you, but um, there's a question. You spoke about the students wanting more immediate, urgent change during their time at CWRU. What are some of the immediate changes you have seen or been a part of? Would you like for me to answer that for you? No, I'm just trying. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I mean, the one, the one that really stands out that, that I like, and it, it, there's no resolution yet, but, um, you know, over the summer, one of the things that our students, they, they jumped and I thought put together an incredible proposal uh, for, for change, things that they wanted. And I, I'll, I'll be honest, our students also, they, they, they did understand that, that it's not going to take, this can't happen overnight. I mean, I will, I will say that, but they do want, want it fast and now, and hopefully before they graduate. Um, the one thing that out of that list that, that really stands out in my mind is, is an improved relations with, with some of our neighbors, like Little Italy. Um, and what, what I really appreciated, and Heather, I, don't know, I can't remember if you've been involved in those conversations as well yes, or not. Yes, I'm a but, part of the executive <laughs> committee for the task force. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we sprung immediately and started to reach out and to, and to try to, to meet with, uh, uh, with, with folks in Little Italy to try to improve the relations there. That to me, I mean, that happened on a dime. Um, I really, I, I mean, again, that, that involves dancing with other partners. And so it's a longer, you know, it's, it's, that's going to be an ongoing thing. But the way I think in which we came together and, and, and immediately started into conversations, uh, that was something that I thought, uh, again, it's just an example of how, how the institution is is taking is hearing, listening, and, and acting. That's right, right. I mean, on, on, on the spry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so another question that we have coming in from the chat also is how helpful do you feel it would be for there to be more of a push for African Americans to explore ideas of Afro Latin and Latin and dad and negritude, et cetera, in terms of global citizenship? Can you say the very first part of that question again? How helpful do you feel that it would be for African Americans to explore more of these ideas? I think it's critically important because it expands our world. It allows us to see other experiences that we can lean on and learn from much the way they have done with us. Uh, one of the things I've learned traveling in Latin America is the way in which, and, and even in Africa, I mean, you know this too, it's other parts, what we've been through with, with the civil rights struggle and our version of slavery, et cetera, it's also inspired others around the world. We can gain as much inspiration from that. Um, I think the story of freedom in Latin America, the Afro-Latin American analogs of freedom that go back into the 1500s, that is inspirational for, 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 for us. And think about young children learning about this coming up. It gives them a whole, you don't have to be shackled by slavery in, in, in the story of, of, of blackness. Um, and, and understanding just the, the, the extent of, of, of that to, to which there were, there were loaded people in Latin America who were, who were of African ancestry, uh, uh, doing incredible things, generals, uh, you know, fighting, doing all kinds of stuff. Most people don't, in the United States don't know half of that. Uh, it, it, is, it is an inspiration. Um, uh, uh, that, that I think uh, we, we can get a lot out of. And it then builds connections with us in other parts of the world. And look, to some extent, you know, the, when, when Malcolm X traveled out, outside, you know, the U.S., uh, uh, Martin Luther King, it opened up their eyes uh, and it created a sense of we're not alone in this. And we can derive inspiration from some of these other examples that will help us in our own tactics and strategy in making things better. And I, I could not agree with you more. And, and with knowing your research and everything, there is um, someone in the chat asked, what's the name of your book? Um, I think, my, well, I've got several, but my most recent book is something called Before Mestizaje, uh, which is literally mean that in, in Latin, in Spanish, that means uh, racial mixture. Uh, and it's really the deep roots of racial mixture in, in Latin America. That's, that's my latest book. Uh, but I would encourage some of you who want kind of understand, uh, at, at a, it's a quicker read. It's about an African-American uh, Tuskegee Airman who lived in Mexico and talks about kind of the border 
there's a book called Flight that what I would also encourage you. Uh, it's, it's one of the more accessible uh, uh, titles of mine. And then I've also done a book, African Slavery in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, which um, is really a, a history of Latin American slavery. I did that with uh, with my advisor, uh, Herbert Klein, um, and it's just a you know, just a survey. It will give you a really good kind of overview of what that experience, what the Afro Latin American experience is all about. So um, there was earlier a question about what are some books that you would recommend. So in that, besides you know your books and what books, what books would you recommend, and what are some of your favorite reads? Mm. Wow. Um, my favorite reads, uh, uh, you know, well, let, let me start with, let me start with my, with, with the books that, 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 that I, um, uh, that, that I would recommend right now that, that I'm, I'm reading through right now. I just finished the, uh, the end of everything, uh, which is a physics book. I like th these, these, these physics books are, are fascinating. The popular physics ones are, are just, I mean, they, they will, they will blow your mind. Uh, and so I, I love that. Uh, I, I love that book. Uh, it's highly readable. Um, and um, just ending by Ibram Kendi, um, Ibram X. Kendi, uh, man. Uh, and there's the remix version, which is the more accessible version. And then there's the, 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 the regular version, which is the book. That is a that is a tour de force. If you want to know like the history of the black experience in, an, in this anti-racist framework, I don't I don't think there's anything better out there. Um, I also like this book by Peniel Joseph, The Sword and the Shield, um, which is a history of Malcolm X and uh, Martin Luther King uh, juxtaposed, perhaps a very readable. Um, uh, one of these books that I think is uh, a, a, an excellent treatment of, of these two figures and their role uh, in, in, in really the sovereignty struggle uh, for African-Americans in the United States. Um, you know, I do like The Gentleman from Ohio uh, about Stokes. Uh, which my, I, I, is bedtime reading uh, for my kids. I, I got one kid who just, he wants to hear, daddy, what's next? Read, you know, what, what happened? Uh, yeah, so I, I like, I like, uh, I like that book. Um, and then um, I'm also reading a book on leadership called Multipliers, um, which is a fantastic book about how you uh, as one person can have, have a radiating effect on building others up. Uh, and there's another book related to that called The Culture Code, uh, which is another, uh, again, a very nice uh, book on, on leadership uh, that is highly readable, uh, really about the role that optimism may play in, 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 in organizations and, and how, that can, how that can really just change things. So uh, there are a couple other things I'm also, you know, you might, you might get, Heather, I, I, I'm, a, I'm one of these, uh, you know, I start a book, now I'll start another book, I'll start another book, and I'll, I'll get through them over time. I got a couple more that I'm going through right now too. That uh, you know, Vanguard, uh, which is uh, by Martha Jones, um, African American Women in, in uh, uh, and, and the Vote, excellent, excellent book. Uh, and I just got Eddie Glaude's new book, uh, uh, which uh, you know he's just he's just he's just great. My my best my favorite books. I don't have one. My favorite books are by this author, Kaz Phillips, Carol Phillips. Um, he's a British um, British. Or no, he's a Caribbean, uh, Caribbean uh, gentleman uh, who has written about the African diaspora. His books are just penetrating reads into the soul. Um, wonderful, wonderful fiction uh, that that I that I like quite a bit. So Carol Phillips, uh, probably one of my, probably my favorite author. Um, uh, and if you're asking me musicians, Kirk Whalem, uh, I got to go with it. Kirk Whalem, uh, you know, sa jazz saxophone. I know you didn't ask me, but. You know, no, that's I, okay. Because you know. next time we're going to ask you your favorite movie. So what's your favorite movie? Since we talk about favorite music, <laughs> we got Kirk Whalen. We've got a list of books. So let's say, what's your favorite movie? Oh, man, you, you have to go there too. Um, wow. You know, the problem is. I'm seeing too much, uh, too much, too much, too many G movies and PG movies right now. So I, <laughs> it's because of my kids. Um, I, I have not seen, you know, uh, I haven't seen, I haven't seen a, a, a good list of movies in, in a while. But um, oh man, you know, I, I'm a fan of of kind of foreign films. Um, so uh, you know, the whole Almodovar uh, uh, movies. Uh, uh, and unfortunately, I don't know the 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 uh, the English <laughs> Tacones Lejanos is, is the book is the movie that I like. And what is that? High heels, high heels. Uh, just to me, a great, a great movie. Um, uh, and uh, it's just uh, really, Oh, I see somebody loves that uh, as well. <laughs> um, 
just a, a, just an excellent movie uh, from okay. my perspective. I, I'm not familiar with that movie, but <laughs> I'm sure it's a great movie. And so one of our final questions that I will ask as we wrap up, you have been in Cleveland now for just over two years. And so what is your favorite thing to do in Cleveland? Wow. You know, Cleveland's great. Um, I got to say, you know, unfortunately, I can't do it right now. But just hanging out at a Cavs game with my kids, you know, that that uh, has been a, brought me so much joy. Um, you know, any of these sports, I mean, we, we've, we've seen we've seen the Cavs, we've seen the monsters, you know, we've even seen monster trucks over there. And, you know, all, all of that stuff, just hanging out in, in, in the arena um, has been has been great fun. And, uh, you know, we got lucky one time. My, my kids actually sat on the floor. I mean, it, it was remarkable. Um, they wouldn't let me sit there, but uh, they, they say, hey, why don't you, you, you kids come on up? And uh, yeah, so they, yeah, you know, it was just mesmerizing. So um, yeah, that, that's got to be one of my favorite experiences right now. Well, you know, we're glad that you're here, or I should say, I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you are a part of Case Western Reserve University. Um, and to kind of sum, sum things up, one request that I will ask that came from the chat is that if you can take time at some point to just kind of jot down the books that you listed <laughs> as your favorite, because someone would like for those books to be sent to the alumni. So if we can uh, get that from you at, at some point. But Provost Benson, um, on behalf of the African American Alumni Association, uh, OIDIO, and the African and African American Studies minor, we thank you for taking time out of your schedule and participating in the Profiles of Inclusive Excellence. Um, I have enjoyed this conversation. I'm sure the listening audience has enjoyed also getting to know you in a different perspective, a new light, and, and learning that your favorite musician is Kirk Whalen. <laughs> and so as we close out this evening, I don't know if you have any final remarks, but I will let you make final remarks, and then I will turn the uh, program back over to Vera. Now, listen, this has been a pleasure. Uh, it's really great uh, to, to be here with everyone this evening. Um, I don't often share this side of me and I probably won't do that again. Uh-oh, is that Nancy and Tim Callahan? Are they in the room? Uh-oh, uh-oh. Oh, my goodness. All, all right, all right. I'm out of here. <laughs> um, really, really quickly, I just thought, and he's on, he's on the camera, and I would like to introduce uh, one of the co-hosts. Uh, for those of you who don't know is, um, and you will get a chance to hear him in our profiles of uh, inclusive excellence later in the academic year, but that's Vice President Robert Solomon. And so Vice President Robert Solomon has made my transition to a new position wonderful. And so I just want him to wave his hand so everyone can see um, that he is in our OIDIO office, which is one of the sponsors of tonight's profiles of inclusive excellence. And so Vera, turning everything back over to you now. Wow, that was really great, uh, Provost Benson. Uh, it's great getting to know you. You are always on the run, so I'm glad you had a chance to sit down and talk to us today. I'm sure our listening audience and participants with their questions are more aware of who you are as well as uh, developing even more of a fondness for you. Um, a man with a great personality, we love it. Heather, it's great meeting you in your new position. We congratulate you. And we see that you have some remarkable ideas and we will move forward. And also to Robert Solomon, our Vice President of Office of Inclusion, Diversity and Equal Opportunity. Thank you for letting us share this platform with you. Um, it's our pleasure to do so. And I wanna give a shout out to Francis Curd, um, a retired dentist from Cleveland all the way down in Florida. He joined us today and I just wanted to give him a personal shout out today. So thank you all for joining us. We hope that um, if you have questions um, and you want to, or you feel that we're not answered today, send them to Chris, Crystal Crosby or the Office of Inclusion to Heather. And certainly we'll try to um, bring it up later on in some of our future discussions. So thanks everyone, have a good evening and we appreciate you and know that we hope everyone stays safe.